Yeah, whatever. Oh, hello. Uh, you're about to watch Richard Shane's Leicester Square Theatre podcast. I was just getting ready to do it, and there you are. Uh, it's a free podcast on video or on audio, whichever you're enjoying it by. You can try and the other way, if you like, as well. Uh, there are lots of ways you can pay us back. Just tell your friends about it. It's a great one if you can't be bothered to pay us any money. Or go to gofasterstripe.com, either buy a badge, buy a monthly badge, uh, and you can subscribe and get extras and, and access to an extra channel. Or just buy a DVD from gofasterstripe.com. And that will help us enormously to carry on with more of these. Anyway, hope you enjoy the podcast. Here it comes. Gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who's just been Googling child's writing desk. It's Richard Herring! <laughs> I can do all that kung fu stuff moving because of the uh, men's health abs challenge. That's why I'm very limber. Now, that's what's going on there. Welcome to Richard Haynes' Leicester Square Theatre Podcast, or as all the cool kids have begun calling it, Rahel Lester Pur. <laughs> oh my goodness, you are cool today. Uh, it's, uh, we're, going to, um, we're going to meet uh, the audience, some of whom Andy McH has left. I'm over here. Oh, why have you got, what are you doing? <laughs> Andy McH was there last week, and now look, he's over. Why have you gone over there, Andy McH? I don't talk to you very much, because you know, I'm restricted. <laughs> What's the, what's the deal? You've been made a friend? No, just in case I have to sneak out. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, just, you're preemptively thinking it's going to be boring? No. No, you got, you're working tomorrow? No. Okay, fuck you. <laughs> uh, have you got a train to catch? No. No. So just in case you have to sneak out for no reason. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, these fellas in the front row? How are you doing? Yeah, good. Good. What's your name, sir? Uh, Amp. 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 Not ant. No, no you've so taken the word Anthony and you shortened it to Anth. Or uh, was it something, Anthea? And it is Anthony. Anth. That's a weird thing to do. What were you, why, were you, why did you live your life in this manner, sir? Everyone here? Not everyone. I'm called Richard. <laughs> or a lot of, there are. Is it to distance yourself from Ant, from Ant and Dead? Or do you just not. Because if you call yourself Ant, like, I'd come and do Ant, and then I'd go, ha-ha, you're an Ant, like an Ant, ha-ha-ha. Is that way, in case comedians pick on you, and then you go, Ant, and the comedian is, is stuck, isn't he? He's kind of, there's no, Ant doesn't mean anything. What can I do? There's nothing I can do with Ant. I also spell it with two A's. You spell it with two A's? Is that so you can get the beginning of the alphabet? Yeah, it doesn't work because people do your surname. <laughs> what, what's, uh, <laughs> do you genuinely spell it with two A's? So A A N T H, you sir are a prick. Uh, <laughs> so, a red glasses prick. That's what I will. That's what I'm gonna. The red glasses should have been the clue. I didn't need to talk to you. Welcome to the show, though. I, I wouldn't want uh, my guests to think I'm generally this rude. To, he was very. I'll be charming to your friend. What's your name, sir? Andy. One A? One A? One Andy with a Y? Well, you're not worried about all the other Andys? People thinking you're the same as all the other Andys? You get, you get, people get confused. It's a very popular name. Unlike Anthony, which no one is fucking called anyway. Just call yourself Anthony. What do you do for a living, uh, Andy? Andy and Anth? I work for a fundraising team at a charity. You work for a fundraising team at a charity. And you think I can't take the piss out of you as a result. No, you think that is... I'm going to... What charity is it? Because then I can really lay into it. Cancer research. <laughs> what? What I like you. I went cancer research. You went UK. I'm not not helping any cancer sufferers. It's kind of the UKIP cancer research. We are only helping people. Yeah, is that it? You only help people. You can go back three generations. There's a, cause there's, you know, there's a lot of disease in the, the UK already. We don't need people bringing over their foreign cancers come, coming over here like a cancer. With their can, it literally is like a cancer in this case. Uh, well, can thank you for all your hard work in helping. Your thank you in your racist work. <laughs> but you know, it's slightly it's it's racist against cancer cells, isn't it? What cancer cells have a perfect right to be 
living in our bodies? Why should we eradicate them? That's my question to you. It's got a bit sort of deep and philosophical and also I'm not sure when you think that analogy through whether what I'm saying might just be sort of slightly racist or Nazi-ish. I can't work it out. I can't. It's gone. It's like the Planet of the Apes analogy. Is it? Pierre Boulet was doing some good work about race relation there up to a point. Uh, so... Uh, uh, to a point. Uh, so, well, uh, w welcome, Andy. We've had some interesting philosophical discussions. You can laugh at anything. That's, uh, you can make a joke about anything. Uh, so, it started well. It surely can't get any better. Uh, so, uh, we will finally we'll introduce our guest. Uh, she's probably best known uh, for appearing on I Love 1980. <laughs> also, I Love 1988. But none of the other 1980s. So she had those, uh, and I respect her for that. She has chosen the two years of the 1980s that she genuinely loved. Can you love two years? That's a question we will find out. <laughs> she is uh, Victoria Corrin Mitchell, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Victoria Corrin Mitchell. Come on in. Hello. Love to see you. I'm very good. Sit down. Pick up a microphone. Put your... Very wise to bring your bag on, just think you can't trust. I'm always bring, I have, like, on everything. I'm Andy McCaitch is the end there. He's just waiting to nip into the dressing room. <laughs> I've left my laptop in there. I'm in real trouble. So, uh, I'm uh, very twitchy about my I need my bag at all times. Why? What's it? What's in there? Nothing. I just have, I have a range of fascinating compulsive disorders. <laughs> and being near my possessions is one of them. Is Gwyneth Paltrow's head in there? That is, that is, <laughs> is that why? No, no one looking there. What do you remember about working on I Love 1980 and I Love 1988? And why only those two years? <laughs> I think probably because I, I figured out after doing those two that it's possible they would recycle those terrible programmes year after year <laughs> after year. Um, you must have been like one year old in 1980. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. I know. How on earth can so I remember those So how could you remember times? anything about 1980? Yes, I don't. I mean, I, I, genuinely, I didn't. I have a terrible memory. And what if you turn up... And they go, do you remember the Persil advert? And you go, no. And they'd show it to you. And then you'd go, I remember the Persil advert. <laughs> and, do, and do the... Th I mean, yeah. terrible. Do you remember Murphy's mob? No. no. <laughs> but no one else does, so that wouldn't have probably made it onto the programme. Uh, Andrew Collins, my uh, erstwhile podcast partner, used to be on the... Did you meet Andrew Collins down on I Love 1980? I mean, I must have done. Yeah. Stuart McConey was certainly always he there. He was always there. <laughs> That annoyed Andrew Collins because uh, <laughs> he felt he was there just as much. Uh, so the first time, I want to get this out of the way, first of all. Yes. I have a feeling we might be, there might be a slightly combative move between the two of us. Uh, that's, I can deal with it. I've had Sarah Milliken on here. It's fine. Uh, why, so, uh, would it, why would it be combative? I, just, I don't know. It's just it's something to do with me and women <laughs> hating no, me. Because Richard <laughs> said right, in so. the dressing room before that they should change family trees to be through the mother's line because you Did. never know who the father is. Yeah. Which... <laughs> well, she took to be casting aspersions on women. Which I, th I think is the opposite of that. He genuinely said, what, that's a very feminist position. What, that they just shag around and lie <laughs> about the result? So we... uh, that human beings shag around and lie. And women are part of that species. <laughs> as I understand. You can't yes. say women don't never lie. Come on, that's insane. So some women lie, some men lie. People fuck around all the time, believe me. My wife said it all the time. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's not my kid. I'm going to bring it up as a bit. <laughs> See, I see, it's already, it's already, you've made me say awful things. It was no. your, <laughs> the first time I met you, yes. this is why I think you might be... Uh, okay, go on. I don't know if you remember, this was at a party in the early 1990s, or right. it must have been mid-1990s, yeah. and I was, uh, you came up to me and you said, what's it like being the unattractive one from Lee and Heron? I did not. <laughs> I did. That was the first thing. I that was the only thing you said to me. <laughs> it might have been. You might have said. You gen I promised you this. You might have said less attractive, but I think it was unattractive. <laughs> Three years later, I thought I should have said, "You'll have to ask Stuart yourself." That, that, that <laughs> took, took me a long time. That's the spirit to scaliate. Uh, but say, uh, all I can say about that—that that doesn't sound like me. Yeah. The, uh, genuinely, the only circumstances under which I can imagine myself saying that is if I was flirting. Right, so, well that's what, that's what I've realised 20 years later. Because <laughs> what happened is you said that and I went... 
and then I'd say, I really hated horrible. going to parties and stuff, and I actually went home after that. First of all, and then now, 20 years on, I kind of think, oh. She was probably trying to get off from me. It was probably an opening. I almost opening certainly was. Yeah, I don't tend to just walk up to people and yeah. just make a horrible personal remark. <laughs> a. B, you will remember in the mid-1990s I was, not that it's so different. I mean, I was probably a size 20 with terrible skin. I wore a hat so that people couldn't see my face. I don't remember that. It, well, that was the... I mean, I really... I was not the type of person... You know, I wasn't like in a Wrigley's advert cycling past going, oh, you don't look right. That is not the correct image of what I was like at the okay. time. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. all right. Well, no, now I realise, you know, we, we could have got married in the 1990s, we'd be divorced by now because of you cheating on me. <laughs> With all that nice, like all the other whores. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> what do you want me to say? And we could be now happily married to our, you know, David Mitchell and Kate, Catherine Wilkins, whichever combination yeah, We took so long like. to settle down. We, it's weird that we haven't got a couple of broken marriages <laughs> it is, behind us. It it's weird. You know, I'm only going to be married once, which is, you know... Definitely. Whatever happens, I'm never, I'm never fucking doing this again. Uh, so, because uh, I, I do this thing each week where I read out, there's, a te- there's an awful website uh, called uh, Dirty Why are Brick. Why they all laughing? Dirty, because I do this every week. It's called Dirty Brickcom Confessions, and it's about, okay. it's people's sexual fantasies generally about uh, okay. comedians and people in comedy. Right. Uh, and I thought, I generally, because, you, you know, I thought there would be uh, lots of quite, you know, disgusting ones about you from perverts. Uh, but they are mainly just very sweet people saying, uh, uh, let's uh, get a nice one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> about David Mitchell. Nothing dirty. But this is, so this is usually quite dirty fantasies that are right. quite comedically funny. Nothing dirty, really, but Victoria Corrin and David Mitchell are a ridiculously cute couple. I want a relationship like that. That's, not, that's not typical dirty Brit com... <laughs> Confession territory, uh, and uh, well, this is one. Uh, oh, this is nice about you, Victoria Corrin, with her hand in front of her mouth when she's laughing, is the most adorable thing ever. I kind of imagine because of the only connecting, there'd be quite a lot of people, nerds, being dominated by the by. <laughs> I'm very disappointed. Uh, this one is kind of interesting, and I want to, you can help with the clarify. Look at this: David Mitchell and Victoria Corrin, sweet, romantic, kinky sex. That's that's about as that's about as. Is that a picture of us kissing? It is. You're kissing at your wedding. Oh, is it our wedding? Well, that's yeah, right. it's all right. That's is that the only that? Yeah, that's the time we did that. Well, <laughs> that would make sense. That's the time we did that in public. <laughs> Right, this is, this is the only slightly weird one, and you can help this person out, I guess. Because these are all anonymous, so but right. they're listening. I don't even like Jimmy Carr, but... <laughs> starts from a weird place. Where's this but, going? But if hooking up with him meant we'd get to have dinner parties and go on couples' holidays with David Mitchell and Victoria <laughs> Curran and Charlie Brooker and Connie Huck, then I'd so do it. <laughs> now... Just before this woman launches into her evil scheme, do you go on many holidays with Jimmy Carr and his partner or romantic? Weirdly, we, we do. Oh, do you? Okay. We, well, we do go on holiday with Charlie Brooker and Connie Hart. Okay. We, they, they are our regular... Yeah, I mean, basically because... Friends. Uh, let's just... Let's just <laughs> let's a, a regular good friend. No, we do, we do go on holiday <laughs> yeah. with them. Um, Jimmy sort of... Uh, He's sort of always working, yeah. and when he does go on holiday, it's a bit too super glamorous for us. I mean, okay. we'd love to. He's really nice. He does have a fantastic partner, by the yeah, way, whoever's planning to get together with him yeah, in order to come on holiday with it's us. It's very easy to break things like that up. But uh, <laughs> if you've got, a, if you've got, a, I would say there would be easier way. I think it would be easier. I might just try and become friends with Victoria and David and see if we can go yeah. on holiday rather than using. Sort it's of a very complex Jimmy plan, Carr, isn't it? come up with holiday mule of some kind (laughs) what I find weird about it is I I genuinely Charlie and Connie are the only friends we sort of ever go on holiday with and I'm wondering how they know that (laughs) that's the that's the spooky thing about the internet that is uh, terrible I'm slightly disappointed is this is as filthy as people's fantasies get about me because I you know I I often think well well, should I read some of these out there isn't really anything uh uh, this, my theory is that David Mitchell and Victoria Conn got back together on the Halloween she wore that cat costume because how could anyone resist her dress like that? Damn. 
<laughs> There's a picture of you dressed as a cat. There, there was a bit. Yes, I was. I did once post a picture on Halloween dressed as a cat. People get excited when I post a picture because normally I think people that post pictures of themselves in cat suits generally are sort of gen- they're sort of terrifyingly perfect looking. Do you know what I mean? You know people that sort of Instagram they look at me. Yeah. I in a cat outfit. I sort of look quite chubby. It's sort of stuffed in. It's about a size too small with badly drawn on whiskers. <laughs> so I think I sort of appeal to that bit in people where they go, Yeah, I, I reckon a couple of pints and she come home with me. And they're probably right. <laughs> you know, it's... I'm not an intimidating vision in yeah. a cat outfit. It's just like, you know, someone dressed a bit like a cat, that's already, that's a bit sexy, it's but... It's sort of weird, you know, it's a lot of... My wife dressed up as a cat for, on Halloween. I think, you know, if I want to have sex with a cat, I would have sex with a cat. <laughs> I do want to have sex with a cat, so it is, you know, it, it works out. <laughs> it works out very well. And better for my cats as well, I have to say. <laughs> my wife will do it. Uh, talking of sex, you, are, you have... Uh, talking of sex, as we were, it's a good link. Is you, there any more sinister remark from an interview? Now, talking, talking of sex. Talking of sex with cats, uh, as we were, you made a porn film. I did. Which is a kind of unusual career direction to take. How I'd love you to clarify, I wrote and directed a porn film. You made a porn You were a porn I, I film. did not appear in it. Okay, well, you've clarified that. It was an artistic project. It was. It was uh, my uh, friend Charlie and I, a few years ago, we had a job as the film reviewers for the Erotic Review. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it was a sort of a quite a filthy publication, like much ruder in a way than a porn mag. Because it was all sort of text, no photos, all texts and sort of Latin words for quim, you know, that kind of... <laughs> like a real headmaster's read, that kind of thing. And... <laughs> we... My father's a headmaster. I don't know <laughs> where this is going. I forgot that, I'm very sorry. <laughs> But we were their film reviewers because we just thought it'd be quite funny. So we, we, we would get these X-rated movies and review them, but like they were proper films. So we would sort of talk about the plot and character and, you know, well, his trousers came off a little early in the scene. But quite seriously. And we had that thing like people do walking around a sort of turn a prize exhibition of, God, I could do a better job of that myself. <laughs> and we, we had this conversation for about a year. We kept saying, well, we could make a better film than that ourselves. And then one day we thought, well, let's, just, let's give it a go. <laughs> and we had various aims because... First of all, we thought, does it have to be that everyone in a porn film is sort of exploited and miserable? Can it be done in a sort of happy, 70s, sort of hippie, collective kind of way? And also, why does the dialogue and plot have to be so terrible? Why can't it be sort of a gripping narrative and sort of emotionally exciting and sort of funny? And and we we sort of succeeded in all of those aims, (laughs) just not the bit where it's erotic. (laughs) So we had, everyone was very happy, There were lots of good jokes. The story was great. If you were in a sexy mood, watching our film would certainly get rid of it immediately. (laughs) I mean, that would it would bring you to your senses. It's not an erotic uh, film, but it's great in its own way. Yeah. Is it commercially available? It's not. It it briefly was, but then Charlie forgot to renew the domain name of the website where we sold it, which is probably the best thing for all concerned. (laughs) And did it was it, it was it was porn actors presumably you cast in it that were already porn actors. Well, no, it? well it was a range, <laughs> was a range <laughs> of people. Some of them were. We went to film it in Amsterdam. I mean, it really was quite a, a, a wide ranging cast. We we, <laughs> we advertised in the newspaper. and We had auditions and stuff. Not that sort of audition. Like we, <laughs> we we met them and chatted. So we had some people who were. You know, I mean, we didn't have much money. People that were hoping to break into porn acting rather than, you know, it wasn't John Holmes. But there were some people who had some experience. Then there was, like, the guy that came to fix my computer and he saw the porn script and said, I'll fix it for free if I can be the plumber. <laughs> um, so he was the plumber. And then his, <laughs> his housemate wanted a part, so he was the confused priest. <laughs> and then... You know, we just, we, we, the people that, it was generally people that answered our advert in the paper, we cast people who we were thought were of the right frame of mind. That was much more important than sort of how they looked or, I mean, we certainly weren't about to sort of ask to see them naked yeah. at the audition. So it was more people that got the joke, thought it was fun, were in control of what they were doing, that sort of thing. It was, I mean, it was a, it's a, they were a nice cast. <laughs> Do you still meet up? Do you have reunions? No, we, we did for a bit. I mean, it was quite a while ago. This was sort of, Probably 12 years ago we made the film. We did. We went back a few times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we sort of emailed a bit. And I think now, I mean, I just haven't, haven't been to Holland for a long time. But we stayed in touch and they, 
you know, they, they, many of them went on to achieve great things within their specialties. Was there any uh, on-set romances? Yeah, I, that, the... <laughs> well, I, I had a romance okay. with, with, the, with the chap playing the boy twin. Okay. Who was at the time, he, you know, he was... Uh, he was, a, he, he was, let's just say, trying... He didn't have a full working visa okay. for, for, for Holland. But, he was, but, and, but his, his life worked out great. He qualified as a lawyer, got his visa. His life is much better. Well, we went on very innocent days. Because if you spend the whole day watching somebody have sex and sort of filming them, yeah. you know, a date... There's not going to be any... I mean, it was just sweet. We yeah. went to the pictures and sort of held hands. You know, so they could be running low on... On fuel as well by yeah. the end of the. <laughs> yeah, and it. <laughs> Depending how young they are, I'm just thinking of myself mainly now, really. Cause that's. It's going to have to wait two or three days for the next. <laughs> to build, build back up again. Ah. Oh, so, does, do, do the people. The people he lawyers for know about his uh, past as. Uh, uh, I expect so. I mean, yeah. there wasn't, you know, in. As is often discussed. Holland isn't quite in the grip of sex shame like we are in this country. I mean, they didn't think it was fine. They were just... They, they turned up, they were in it, you know. They were quite... They, I mean, they were quite open about wanting to get into that kind of work. And, <laughs> you know, one guy that was brilliant... One of the, the, the chap that played our terrifying castle henchman... Um, <laughs> he said... He said, he said, I tell you what, uh, I'd like to... Uh, there's someone I'd like to bring to play my partner in the scene. It was a, a fabulous, beautiful gay scene we'd planned between... Because somebody had to get past the castle henchman into the castle, you see. And it being that... Given the genre we were working in, the plan was that the henchman would be distracted with sex. So another henchman and he would sort of fall into this passionate embrace and our hero would get past into the castle. So he said, no, there's this, I, there's this guy I've been trying to seduce him for ages. I think if I offer him this part in the film, we're going to get together. <laughs> He showed us pictures, the guy was fantastic. We said, anyway, that's absolutely fine. You know, we'd love people to, to bring their own partners, no problem. You know, bring him on the day and you'll know, be absolutely fine. And then he turned up, I up on the day in an absolutely foul mood. He said, he, he didn't come at the last minute, I've had to bring my long-term boyfriend, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and he brought his long-term boyfriend and of course the two of them, you know, they've been together 10 years. I mean, the sex between them could not have been less erotic. They're sort of, the two of them are sort of bored and annoyed, fiddling with each other. You know, in the middle of this... Oh, stop doing that. You always do that. <laughs> I'm sort of saying this is supposed to be an erotic movie. So as much as you think, oh, that's lovely for people to have their own partners. If they've been together too long, the magic doesn't really uh, come across. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, I'm just, I'm just seeing. You're lost in a reverie, no, aren't I'm just, you? I've just seen that. What's it like being the unattractive one from Lee and Heron? I just saw that again. I, that's, that's. I don't think I even said that. That's the truth. I think that is a false memory. I think you've your own twisted I went, I went unconscious. Home and cried. I remember it's, it's in my. Why would I? I was say very shy. That? And I didn't really like going to parties. What nobody does. <laughs> they do. People. Do. I didn't that's like going come, to parties. It's all come back to me now. I don't think I would have said that. I, if I did, I just would have meant it in a sort of cute way. <laughs> I'm very insecure. But, you know, I, you, now you, you would have to ask you. That is the irony. Uh, so, um... <laughs> it was now. Ah, oh, time, you cruel mistress. <laughs> so, um... You play uh, poker. So it's something I've gleaned from... Uh, <laughs> We could be, no, we, I've played poker, I think we must have played at some point. You've certainly watched me play poker and been sarcastic about my abilities to play poker. Do you have this memory of our whole history of me <laughs> just being rude, nasty? No, you were correct. You were, when you actually both things were correct. Yeah, because you, when I very early started playing a poker, I did the celebrity poker thing in Wales yeah. that you were then the commentator for because you'd already yeah. won it, I think, hadn't you? That's right, yeah. So uh, then you became a commentator as well as... Carrying on playing and then playing rather more seriously, so I was I was pretty bad. But you you took it a little bit more. You seriously. were not better than most of the people on that series. Well, I did all right in my heat, but I was terrible in the. I, I was very bad in the final. Uh, but because uh, I, I was, I, it was, it's a very scary game. It can be. Well, you know, because you know. the thing is, you don't know what the other people have got. <laughs> That's what makes it hard. <laughs> if that they is, would show is. you, 
would be less nerve-wracking. Yes, no, not knowing what the other person's got is very much yeah. the nub of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you're good enough to be able to tell what the other person's got like by being magically working out what yeah, they're thinking. But I don't find it scary. I mean, no. some people will play a, a, a sport, you know, where you sort yeah. of... I, mean, I don't really understand about a sport, but my understanding is you sort of run about, throw things. <laughs> I mean, that seems terrifying. You could twist an ankle, you could be hit in the face with a... I mean, that's terrifying, but it's some people's idea of fun. Yeah. And, you know, I understand poker. Some people go, oh, that's terrifying, and your money's at risk, and, that, you know, it's like beads of sweat trickling down and so on, but I, I enjoy it. Yeah. And you've been, well, you were playing for a long time. You've been playing all through the 90s against your brother's friends. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, go, you were going to the Vic, which is this famous sort of... I mean, it's a legal, it's a legal place, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, the, so, the it's, it's absolutely legal, yeah. yes. <laughs> but, uh, but it's like it's your image of a poker den with lots of... Yeah, I mean, I've, I've played in places in the, the, the licensing of which is a little more yeah. questionable. Yeah. But, but the Vic is... <laughs> yeah. It's a very... You know, it's a proper card room in London with a licence and everything. Yes. But yes, it was... Especially in the 90s, it was quite smoky and, you know, you don't want to ask too many questions about how people got the money no. to play. <laughs> but it's got that again as a as a woman in your twenties. Then that was quite an odd choice of uh, an evening spent until six o'clock in the morning playing poker with some strange men. Yeah, I mean, but uh, you just love because I mean, I was quite strange. So you say that about oh, I didn't like going to parties and I was quite shy and yeah. you know, is that I was very much like that. I think most people are, but I was definitely at the extreme end of it. And poker less so now because it's so respectable and mainstream, so many people playing. But certainly when I started. It was very much a community of people that didn't have a community. Yeah. It, it was, you know, I mean, I wrote about this in my book, is that I would look around and there'd be sort of, you know, there'd be Mr. Chu, the sort of old Chinese man. I mean, he must be 200 years old. And he had that thing that some old Chinese men sometimes do, that the, the nails on his little fingers were incredibly long. <laughs> and then all the others short. And he'd be there and he's sort of wondering about muttering to himself and... and, and Pedro, I remember, was it? when I first met him, it was made clear to me that what he did every time before he went to play, he, he'd buy some fish and chips from the shop around the corner, and when he got to the Vic, he'd hide the fish and chips under a bush outside, so that when he came out at two in the morning, he'd collect them and eat them on the way home. And, you know, they definitely thought I was the weirdest person <laughs> in there. I mean, they... <laughs> You know, who is this girl? And this posh girl as well, as far as they were concerned. Yeah. I mean, the nuances of what's posh and what isn't are a different argument. But to them, I see Princess Margaret's <laughs> turned up to play. And But, you know, we were all weird. Everyone was there yeah. for a reason. Everyone was there because they didn't have somewhere else to be. Or they did, but they didn't want to be there. Yeah. And so it was a sort of, a, you know, very much a, a <coughs> confederacy of the sort of lonely and odd. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, you've now become, like, uh, I mean, even though you have another profession, you are essentially a professional poker player. You've won, you're the only player to win two European poker tour tournaments, which is, like, incredibly difficult. You could be the, because it's, even if you're the best player in the world, there's a there's a degree of luck within poker. Yes, that yeah. over Because that my main problem with poker, which I do love playing poker, and it's a great game, but the, it's, the tournaments are so long, and my attention span is not good. And I realised there was a position, there was a point around that time where I, where poker got very trendy, and people were people were saying, "Oh, do you want to write? Someone want me to write a book about poker?" And they were going to pay me fifteen thousand pounds to write the book about poker, but that was they weren't going to give me any money to play poker. Right. So I realised. You were worried you were going to make a loss. Well, I realised in all likelihood I would take fifteen thousand. It wasn't that good enough, you know. It was, it was like the poker <laughs> joker going from nothing to try and play in tournaments. I would lose £15,000 over the year and then have to write a book for free. <laughs> I realised that was what was going to happen because, because my, you know, I, I just get impatient and then I just, I just start playing every hand. Yeah, patience is very much... Yeah. yeah, because these tournaments, they can last five or six days. Not always, yeah. it can be two days. But part of it is it's a bit like riding a mechanical bull. You know, you're yeah. just staying on and sort of sensing when the waves of luck are going this way or that way and sort of riding them properly. And you just get really horrible, bad, what they're called bad beats, where you're way ahead and then two cards come up that change everything and you suddenly lose. Yes. And, it seems, and that just always seemed to happen. To well, you've got, you've got to have the right temperament. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of things required in poker, but I always say to people, if they don't know whether to play or not, to read um, If, you know, the Kipling poem. Yeah. Because that very much sums up, that's the attitude you need to have for poker. You can't be someone that either, you know, gets sort of bitter and angry with the injustice if you're unlucky, or, you know, 
gets all cocky and over proud of themselves if they're lucky. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, <laughs> I can meet with triumph and disaster in an equally obnoxious way. <laughs> so I should be good. Uh, but I'm, no, I'm, I'm very competitive. And so then it does, inf as you know, I was on pointless as I was talking to Richard Osman about, yeah. uh, and got knocked out in the front row, f first round, and the front row, in the first round, and uh, I was very upset for, like, uh, like really depressed for a no, week. No, but you see, the problem is one of the reasons I would never go on that yeah. pointless, because on that show, you absolutely just get a category you don't know anything about. It yeah. doesn't mean you're, it's not like a wide range of things. I knew loads about the category. Oh, really? Yeah. What went wrong? Uh, I had to choose an obscure answer. Because my teammate had got. What was the? Go, let me have a go. What was the theme? Really, well, it's kind of hard. It's the it's 1980s solo number ones stars who've had a solo number one in the 1980s. You should be great at this because you know you've had, you love if it's as long as it's 1980s. How many points for Glenn Medeiros? Probably not very many because actually, as it turned out, even Michael Jackson was like 25. But it wasn't until the end of the round that I found this. Everything was about seven. Adam Ant was seven, and uh, Paul Young was seven. My partner got 100, and so I, had to get, I felt I had to get under, a se under seven. Right. So I felt I had to go for something quite obscure. And you went for? Brian Ferry. Did he, did he I mean, not Roxy Music? Well, it was Roxy Music, but he had, I knew he had it. Uh, my problem was I, got, I was so wanted to do well. I'm, I'm sorry to tell the people at home this story so many times, but <laughs> it helps me through it. Uh, <laughs> that I, I really wanted to do well, and I, but I then they had ages up and down, and I, was I had loads and loads of answers that would, would, would have probably got us through. Uh, and but I but then I was thinking was that definitely 1980s was it definitely number one and I knew Brian Ferry was definitely number one I knew it was definitely 1980 because it was after John Lennon had died right and I was 90% certain that he'd released it under his own name because it was like a quick release they did it quickly for mm. they, they did it under Roxy Music still and I, in, at the back of my mind I knew that John, Brian Ferry's only had one number one and I thought it was under his own name so I was too clever for my own good yeah. should have just said Joe Dolce one point <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I convinced myself that was 1970 so I, you know but I get I'm very competitive uh, in games not so much in real life uh, <laughs> so I take games incredibly seriously whereas I think I'm a nicer person in real life uh, but so the poker when I get a bad beat in poker it kind of I can't sleep and it stays with me for a long time no then, yeah, it might not be the game for no. you and I was just losing loads of money and then I thought Maybe I should write those scripts that people are actually going to pay me for <laughs> rather than sit here playing uh, internet poker. Uh, but you've done all right out of it. You've made $2.4 million. I've done all right. Could I have, like, if you just gave me about <laughs> 20,000 of those, that would probably pay off my debts. For poker. <laughs> that's nothing to you. That's a drop in the ocean to you with your $2.4 million. Yeah, but you have to bear in mind quite how many people I know that are losing at poker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mainly the people playing against you. So that's. Uh, <laughs> That's not fair. Uh, and But well, this is a story you told on uh, when I, I did Have I Got News For You with you. Yeah. Was it the first time you did it? Or was it the second time? I don't know. I, I think can't. it might have been the first time you did it. I've, been. I've done it twice. How many times have you done it? Uh, what, this is like being... <laughs> <a story. laughs> You've done it loads times? of times. You've done it loads Five of times. Because you're good at it. But you told this story about uh, Sir William uh, Ormerod. Or, is that Ormerod. Ormerod. Yes. Which was, seemed unbelievable, this... Uh, this whole story, oh, but I yes. don't think it made it onto the TV because it was quite a long story. So it, well, it's like quite an interesting story if people don't know it already. Are you sure? I mean, it is quite a long it story. It is, but I, would like to, I think people won't know it already. Okay, well, this is interesting. So. Well, you know, my having just said, oh, I've got the right personality for poker, because I'm, I'm laid back and philosophical, and, you know, in another way, I have a sort of Old Testament vengefulness in my <laughs> character, which is illustrated by that story. But <laughs> when my father died, we were going to have a memorial service for him because... We wanted to have the funeral very quickly and not too many people, and it was all a bit too sad, and, you know, he had lots of friends with it. We'd have a memorial service <coughs> later, which was supposed to be for, I mean, obviously, sort of friends and family and people that he'd worked with, but also there were fans of his, you know, the readers that had loved his work, and we thought, wouldn't you, we'd like them to come as well. But I, I got a tip-off. Somebody warned me, and this is very peculiar, but somebody warned me that there was a gang of people operating in the sort of southeast of England who like to gate crash funerals and memorial services for sort of free food and drink. And it was like a bit of a laugh and they, you know, they made it a big challenge them. Could they get into these places? And they'd pretend to know the person um, so that they could get in and then they'd snaffle all this food and booze. And it sort of seemed very tacky and horrid. And I thought, well, now, 
I'm not having that. And my, perhaps my competitive streak, I thought... Well, and just your streak of decent is a pretty <laughs> horrible thing for them to Well, do. it was sort of horrible, but it was definitely the poker player in me thought, yeah. well, I think if you want to try and crash this one, you might have messed with the wrong player. <laughs> but, of course, the challenge I had was that, you know, because we had an email address, we put a notice in the paper like you do and said, you know, if you want to come along drop us an email and generally it divided into people that said well I never met him but I loved his work fine or friends but obviously I I didn't know who all his friends were you know he was 70 and he, uh, who knew so you couldn't really be sure so and you don't want to write back to all the people and say are you a con artist you couldn't do that so I thought right, I'm gonna have to go about it another way so I, I came up with a chap called Sir William Ormerod a, a sort of wealthy industrialist I sort of invented him and I put him all over the internet, I sort of sprinkled him onto the internet, so I went on to various, I created web pages for him, you know, his history as an industrialist and places he'd given money to and, you know, he'd founded a scholarship at the Pocklington Arts Centre, that was one of them, and I sort of sprinkled him all over the internet. Um, and then I announced his death uh, and memorial service. And I put this in the Times and I said, you know, the memorial service for, um, for Sir William Ormerod, uh, friends and family only. Please write to this address if you'd like tickets. And, you know, the paper goes online at midnight. And by quarter past midnight, I had probably 15 emails <laughs> saying, ah, oh, how fondly I remember Sir William from our days together at the Pocklington Arts Centre. I mean, email after email from people saying, you know, I knew Sir William for many years. What a tragic loss. Uh, so obviously I had all the names, because that was the only way you could know for certain. If I invented the dead person, then when they all write and say they know him, that, uh, you know, I win, I thought. That w where, it, where it fell down, I had various plans. My, my, my big scheme was going to be that I would actually go ahead with the memorial service for Sir William Walmart, and they'd all come, and I'd put laxatives in the canapes. <laughs> When it came to it, it was, uh, you know, it was nearly Christmas and for, for whatever reason, I was overcome with a sort of kindly spirit and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to let them come. And I, I wrote an article about it in the paper and I, I wrote an article saying, uh, watch out, you know, if you're planning to have a funeral for somebody, watch out for these people, this is how they operate, this is broadly who they are and I, I think it's a terrible thing, but I wrote that and then let them come because I thought in the end it's a church service and you shouldn't turn people away and I hope, I hope in their hearts and certainly when they read the paper they'll know they've done a terrible thing. But so I never quite completed the plan. No. But uh, I set the heffalump trap and they fell in and <laughs> I enjoyed that immensely. Such a weird thing to, you know, like crashing weddings is sort of, there's a jolliness to that. Yeah. It's a sort of crash funerals. It's a very, very weird. And th there, was a, there was a curious postscript to it, actually, about a year later. I didn't put their names in the, in the paper for various reasons. I put the name of the, the ringleader, who's called Terence Jolly. I like to say that a lot. Of Terence Jolly, J-O-L-L-E-Y. Do Google him. You'll see a picture. Ghastly man. He was the ringleader. But the other ones, I didn't put the names because I wasn't sure to what extent they were just in his slipstream. But I knew all the names. And they weren't the sort of people you'd think. I mean, these were... People in their sort of 50s and 60s, very respectable, sort of retired magistrates. You know, they were really respectable. I mean, Lord knows what their dark reasons were. But I, one of the names that I'd read about, I, about a year later, I was reading the paper and it was just a little story about this chap who had once been something connected to an embassy. And it said that, you know, he'd unfortunately died... He'd, he'd, he'd gone to a party to celebrate the National Day of Ghana <laughs> and choked to death on a canapé. <laughs> and what was odd, the, the diarist said, was that he hadn't actually bitten on the list of invitees. <laughs> and you know, this was like a Hilaire Belloc thing. I thought, why? What? So he's continued, despite Martin continued with the crashing, yeah. and he's gone to a thing he's not invited to and choked to death on a canapé. I mean, you... <laughs> and then the people who do that with him have to decide, are we going to go to his funeral as his friend? <laughs> or are we going to crash? How will we feel when we're eating these canapes that we're slightly entitled to? It's yeah. going to be... Will that ruin... They'll be like chalk in our mouths. 
You should go to, you wait till they all die and you should gatecrash all of their funerals. Gatecrash their funerals, yeah. <laughs> but that is such a bizarre uh, story. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, but uh, good, I'll ask you an emergency question now. Uh, so, uh, if you had to choose, this is a this is a series five emergency question. Mm -hmm. Feeling it might not get into unless this is series six. It might not get into the next series. I think we may have squeezed uh, most of the life out of this one. Uh, if you had to choose between going, imagine uh, David Mitchell has sadly died, and uh, that's a horrible thing. But to you've say. got to, yeah, it's all right, uh, and you've uh, <laughs> but you got over it. You got over it, and you're moving right, on. Okay, with your I'm life. over it, am I? Right, right. You started dating again. If you had to choose, don't really need that bit of the question. That no. bit, sorry. If you had to choose between dating a man, would you rather date a man who was a six foot tall penis, literally just a penis? Whatever a the other one is, I'll take it. Okay. You might like the other one. Wait and see. Never jump in. Uh, or, uh, or, so it's like a, it's just like a penis, but it's really big. It's got a face on it, so you can have a conversation. So it's like there's its face. Otherwise, it's a penis. It's wearing a suit and stuff. But it speaks. It's a person. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a penis. So it's a six, six foot tall penis, but it has acquired the power of speech and has a face, but the rest of it is a penis. It doesn't, right. it doesn't have any genitalia of its own. Uh, okay. I mean, that's a plus. It's not, I'm not, my okay. big concern is not how do I shag this creature. <laughs> it, it would be, um, I think, unpleasant. Okay, or? Uh, or a man who, instead of having a penis, has a tiny man. That's like, that's like there, just looking up, and it's facing the man, uh, and it's a, it's autonomous and uh, has his own personality. They don't necessarily get on that well, because <laughs> especially the little man doesn't really like the situation he's found himself in. His feet downwards, uh, there are still balls there underneath him. Do you tell you Which what, I'm going to I'm going to answer the question with a question. Okay. Have you ever had therapy? <laughs> I'd like to think of the, this podcast as partly as my therapy. I mean, how, how, have I you, how have you arrived <laughs> at this choice of... I mean, as you lay there thinking, right, I'm yeah. going to offer women a choice. It's not just women, I offer it to men as well. It's very sexist of you to make that assumption. <laughs> <laughs> Does the, the, the man... Milton Jones chose the six-foot penis, so uh, <laughs> there you go. He's the first person to do that. The man that has the little man yeah, where the man. genitals should be... Yeah. Do, do, do we have a sex life, he and I? Well, yeah. Well, you know, that's see how the date goes first. Hold, I mean, uh, hold your horses. <laughs> see how you go. Yeah, you do. Uh, you know, if you, if you, that's where, it, obviously, it will progress. So you will have to find some way to... Because I don't with the, with the six foot. No, you would do as well. You'd have to find a way. I mean, you could pleasure him. <laughs> Just... Or just, you know, there could be kissing involved or whatever. You can insert things into... I think, I think... <laughs> I, I think the... I, think, I suppose the, the one with the... Yeah. With the little person? Yeah. Well, it's a difficult choice. A lot of people have to think quite hard about it. Which would you like? I mean, gun to my head, yeah, I'd take the bullet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be like that'd be nice with the I think it'd be nice because it'd be like going out with two different people and more than that if the tiny man also has a tiny man as his penis it could go on it could be like but what you're not being friends. look it's no, this is not the kind of conversation I usually have publicly but okay. you are not being clear <laughs> about you, what the sexual intimacy you might have to use the little man as a cock sometimes that's yeah <laughs> then well then I'll take the other one okay well, you can see it was important that we the other one it. <laughs> And you say, I, I, I'm over the tragic death of David Mitchell yeah. as, I, as I date these two. But I'm over it, I'm fine. Yeah. Back on the market. Okay. I mean, it just I'm, so happens that t the two people who've come up on Match.com, probably it's not on their profile, you discover when you go on the date. And then, but those are the only two matches you've got. All right, I'll ask you a more sensible question. If you had to choose between having a hand made out of ham or an armpit that dispensed sun cream, which would you choose? And we can then compare that with your husband's answer, who has also answered this question. The armpit. You like the armpit that dispensed sun cream? Yes. What have you got against the handful of ham? 
Well, just for starters, yeah. <laughs> D- Connie Hock, who we mentioned earlier, who's yeah. one of my favourite people in the world, and one of my even more favourite people... Has a ham made a- out of ham already? <laughs> That'd no, be amazing. Get they the don't show. eat ham. She's from a okay. Muslim family. She and her... Ch- they don't have... I have many you have friends. You to make her eat your ham. No, but that's... <laughs> the kind of relationship you have with Connie I have, <laughs> I feel like... You know, Jewish and Muslim people yeah. might find me a bit disgusting with my hammy hand. They just don't like eating ham. They don't have a, don't mind it being around. They don't mind it being someone's digits. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't actually be ham, though. It would just be a ham, exact replicant of ham. It wouldn't have come off of a pig. So it would. It, it would wouldn't have, have come off. No, it would have grown well, then from it's naturally not from your body. But it would be exactly. Well, then it's ham. It, what do you mean? I've got. <laughs> Ham that grows naturally off my body is what my hand already is. <laughs> well, there you are. <laughs> if it, yeah, obviously, if it's not from a pig, I'll take the ham hand. If it is, okay. I won't, out of respect okay. for people who find that an offensive what thing. What about people who don't find it offensive? What about respecting them? People who, <laughs> well, people who want everyone to have one hand made out of ham. What about their, <laughs> what about their beliefs? Why are you... What did, what did, on there. So what did my husband say? He chose the ham yeah, hand, he? went with the ham hand, I think, yeah. Did he? Did anyone know? And it's unlikely anyone will remember. I bet he did, because he hates sun cream. He finds yeah. it really annoying. <laughs> so you might, you should go for the armpit, because, you know, you've got the hand ham Yeah, there. We've, we've got the best of both you've worlds. Got, you've got it sort of between the two of you. And shame I didn't ask him about the penis, the date and the penis thing. <laughs> it's, it's a shame. That is a, that's the biggest shame. <laughs> Think of this decade in the in the whole world. I didn't ask him that. If you had to choose between having a tit that dispensed talcum powder, I beg your pardon. T- <laughs> if you had to choose between having a a nipple, a that, tit, a tit, a breast, like a that's breast, what you mean? Okay, yeah, a yeah. breast that dispensed talcum powder, yeah. or a finger that could travel through time, <laughs> which. Are, which of those two things would you choose? <laughs> you can have one or the other, but not both. It, the, the, a finger that travels Just your time. finger can go anywhere you, you program in, and a little portal where you could go in any height. It doesn't have to be that height. It could be that height. Anywhere in time or space it could be as well. And then your finger can go in well, and alter history or the future. You can look, peek in around it and see what's going on. So you might see, you know, William Shakespeare's face or something. Wait, is there a person alive that would say no? I'd have a tit of talcum powder. I mean, you know. Maybe if you were, I think now because I'm about to have a baby, I might take the tit, the tit that would spend talcum powder. Yeah, you can get talcum powder at Boots. I mean, obviously, <laughs> not that much. So it would be an unlimited amount, and you could set up a talcum powder factory. Listen, I tell you what, I, somebody's got to tell you this before your child is born. Yeah. The breasts will be required for another purpose. <laughs> not mine won't though. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's my. It's my tit. Oh, I see. It's, gonna, it's gonna be pretty, uh, he or she's going to be pretty hungry to, uh, to have to feast on what I'm going to. I mean, I'll do my best to whip up some colostrum, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, but the, I mean, clearly the finger. Yeah, what, where would you send your finger if you could send your finger anywhere in time? <laughs> and what would, you, what would you do with it? Wait, wait, does the finger come back with information it can give me? Your finger's still attached to you, just your finger would be in another time stream, so you could affect things in that time stream very slightly. I mean, you could blow up, you could send a nuclear bomb off or something like that, so you could do like some quite diabolical things, or you could just poke someone. I don't go, think I'd do that. Either. Oi! Have a think, go, go, Hitler, have a think about what you're doing. You could shout <laughs> through the hole, have a, just have a think. <laughs> well, is, it, is it a good idea what you're doing? Well, maybe you should think a bit more about it. I think that's more like... The, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't send it into the future, because I don't think I'd want to know about the future, because no. then I'd, I'd, it's, cause it's bound to be better, wouldn't it? So I'd be sad about the things that we didn't have that they have in the future, so I wouldn't do that. Okay. But I would send it into the past on research trips. I'd like to know about Shakespeare. If you send it into the future, then future people might be able to do something to your finger that would make it really ama- better. <laughs> Could just put it in the future and then they could yeah, customise it. There's a limit to it. how amazing a finger can be, and I don't want that quoted out of context. It's, that, it's, it's like when in Back to the Future, where the car comes back and it now can fly. That, maybe your finger... Maybe they'll do it so your whole, they'll give you a power that your whole hand can travel through time. Yeah, I, do, I feel like this, that there's limited excitement to that. I think I would just send it into the past and it could tell me stuff. 
you know. I'm not a talking finger. It's just still your finger. You're an insane. Uh, when you are writing a newspaper columns at home, yes, is it difficult because your husband also writes newspaper columns? Do you have to ask him about whether what he's writing about this week to make sure you don't write about the same thing? And if you have an argument, do you have to go? I'm writing about this. We, it, that's no, I mean, we don't really have arguments, but if we did, it wouldn't be about that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> we, we don't, uh, it, and Me and my wife argue all the time about that kind of things that would be newspaper columns. Really? Yeah, all the time. It's mainly about feminism, I have to say. But it's, uh, <laughs> and, we, and we agree with each other. We completely agree with each other, but we always argue about it. See, that's, we, we have real basic sitcom married argument. Our right. last big row was because he forgot to put the bins out. Right. And, well, you really had a row. Like, even as you know in your head, I can't believe I've become a person that has a row because their husband didn't put the bins out. Yeah. I was still furious. <laughs> Is that his bailiwick, the, the bins? Well, he's supposed to put the bins out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not <laughs> bloody doing it. Okay. So I was very what annoyed. areas of the house are your domain? And which... Because I do the bins. I love doing the bins. There's no... If you'd married me back in the yeah. early 90s, the bins would have been out every week. A bit, a bit early, if anything. Well, and I go around the house. I love the bins. I go around the house emptying all the bins into the big bin to make sure all the bin liners are as full as possible <laughs> so that no bin liners get wasted. I hate it when people... Sometimes guests come. And because the bin liner in the kitchen bin is not is a bit too big for the, the... They'll sometimes put that out just like with a quarter full. But I will always go around the house and make sure there's as much... I'll leave oh. it, I'll take it out of the bin and I'll put it in the corner of the kitchen until the bin is full. And then I'll put it out. But I will always put the bin out. And I always do the dish... I love doing the dishwasher. That is a very man, Ben Elton thing to do. I mean, not in our house. Who, who, do, you do, the, do you do the dishwasher? Yeah, it's... it's, it's there's quite an old-fashioned division, actually. Okay. I quite like... The kitchen stuff. I right. quite like the well, the cooking bin, is and the, the bin. Dish not in the, the kitchen is that? Yeah, while it's in How the kitchen, fine. When it has to go outside, that's his problem. <laughs> <laughs> you, so you do you do the cook? Do you cook? I do cook. Okay. And does David never cook? I'm no. being like Hello Magazine. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> not he will. I mean, it's not cooking is not like massively his thing. No. For example, the other day, I, I mean, I was literally making scrambled eggs, and he stood there and watched. And afterwards, he went. I almost feel like I could make them now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but he's not... Because I, I think, you know, he... he, he I think... I don't, I don't... Some men might make it a priority to learn to cook, but I think David was... You know, he had a long time... He lived with a, a flatmate, and, he, you know, he was single for a long time, and I think his priority was really beer. <laughs> you know, I think when the, when the evening rolled round, it was, how are we going to get beer? <laughs> And sometimes they'd have a take. I he wouldn't sort of go, oh, I think I might knock up a couple of chicken Kievs and a cabbage. <laughs> that wasn't... It, it wasn't... He didn't care enough about it. He didn't really do that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not so big on beer, and I think it's nice for us to have meals, so I make... He did make me a birthday cake once. Oh, well, that's hard. That was lovely. Was it yeah, nice? He, it was really... It was, not, it was lovely to be given it. He... he <laughs> <laughs> It, it was nice. He, he made it. He'd, he made it watching an online video of how you. <laughs> so he was sort of stirring it until it looked like like it did in the picture. I was very touched. It was very nice. Yeah. yeah. It's like he's a four-year-old child. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 he's not a big cook, you know. Oh, that's nice. Um, I do the bins. I do the dishwasher. I do like thirty. I always do breakfast. This is the great. If you'd married me, ladies, because you all had a chance. Uh, seriously, uh, I can't believe I got someone to marry me in the end. It's very, it's absolutely fantastic. I make porridge every morning uh, with fruit and seeds. Do and nuts you? In it. Yeah, every morning. Wow. Uh, and uh, bring that to my wife in bed. That's nice. Yeah, uh, and I usually make one of the other meals, but uh, I know. Yeah, David makes tea in the morning. There, that's one of his. Yeah. I do the lot. The lot. <laughs> you get, if you'd been married to me, yeah. like, you get porridge, you get an act to melt, strawberry flavour. That's the answer. Not just even regular act to melt, strawberry no, flavour. A bit of proactive bacteria uh, Barocca, in the you gut. You get a Barocca. 
tea or coffee of your choice. I can make you a cappuccino, latte. Wow. This is all hypothetical now. Back in like, if you bothered to talk to me a bit more, if you'd bother to start the conversation <laughs> in a nice way, I could have said, well, this is what's on offer, Victoria. If you want to come back tonight, there'll be... A, no, I wouldn't have because you still had 20 Playboy years ahead of you. You weren't I, running for the old tray of Actimel right. back then. I wouldn't have been able to make you a cappuccino then either. Yeah. Uh, I probably wasn't even making porridge. I'm talking out my ass. Uh, I'm talking, I'm coming here, big Billy porridge bollocks, aren't I? With my... <laughs> yeah. There would definitely have been a bit of that in there as well. So, um... They can't... Once you mix it in, they can't tell. <laughs> dapper laughs. I've turned into dapper laughs. Uh, it's... So you never have a problem dividing up the columns... No, I want to write about sexism. Not really. I mean, it's true. We do occasionally have a sort of interesting conversation about something that's in the news and then yeah. we'll go, or oh, somebody, you know, who's going to write about that? But it's usually quite obvious. Yeah. It's usually sort of clear who wants it's to write easy, about that more. My wife's a comedian. We know it's easy. Uh, so, don't know why I asked you. It's easy. Uh, <laughs> and Only Connect. Yes. I've never been invited on Only Connect. I would have thought I would be the ex an excellent uh, No, you person. probably would. I mean, we only, in terms of our yeah. guest quizzes, our invitational star yeah. quizzes, you know, we only have, like, eight a year, so... I would be really bad at it. I would you? I can't even get through the first round of Pointless. Come on. Uh, I don't, it's quite, it's hard, do not it? It's proper difficult. It is difficult. In fact, one yeah. of them was on tonight. Yeah. I hope at least some of you have put that on the Sky Plus or whatever is the modern. You're going to watch the... It's, it's a go with it. Say that again? So yeah, Kate Moss. Kate Moss, Kate exactly Moss. so. Yeah, Kate Moss. Our, 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 our Kate Moss, yeah. not that other Kate Moss. Who, <laughs> she wouldn't be very good at the quiz. No, Pat it's, a, it's a very cool line-up Patrick tonight. Marber's on. Team captains Ka Patrick Marber and <laughs> Professor Steve Jones. Oh. That is... That why are you making makes, that face? It's like having Satan and God on, isn't it? That is that it's very... <laughs> Very similar. I'm not, I don't, not Do you don't like Patrick Marber? Yeah, uh, What's wrong with Patrick Marber? <laughs> I don't think we've got... I don't think we've got the time. Really? I love Patrick Marber. Oh, the He's lovely. The only person what? I've ever met who's ever said that. That's <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> really? I, do, I have an affection, affectionate uh, pantomime... Uh, deep hatred of him. No, no, <laughs> no we, I'm, I'm, we, we worked together in the early 90s. It was a lifetime ago. No. He was, no, he's an interesting, he's an interesting fellow. <laughs> he's lovely. He, Patrick Marber is lovely. Did, how did he get on in the? Was he good at the? You'll have to comments? go home and watch. But you know who was on the other team? Your friend Kevin Eldon, or Kevin, yeah, to Kevin Eldon. Yeah. yeah, to Kevin Eldon. He was on there. <laughs> See, that's was he? He was on Steve Jones's side. He was on Steve Jones's side. Yeah. See, that is. And who's the other? Who's the other one on that side? That Kate Moss. Wow, well, that's an amazing and team of nice people. Patrick's team. He's got Robert Peston and Sophie Grigson. Yeah, awful. <laughs> It's like, it's like good versus evil, isn't it? No, I, don't I don't think really, so. No, I don't, like them all. I don't really know those people well. Uh, I was, it was just for comic effect. But it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a tricky quiz. But people are... People are it's, 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 so it started on BBC 4. Is it on BBC 2 now? It's just moved to BBC 2, yeah. It's uh, sort of like University Challenge of the 21st century. Even though well, University Challenge, university is, challenge is a sort of, a, you know, it's a nice gentle warm-up exercise <laughs> for people that are then going to go on for the, for the real deal of Only Connect. Yeah, no, I... Um, Do en does anyone ever get it on the first one? Occasionally. You know, rarely enough for it to be very special. But you're not sometimes. allowed to have a guess, are you, and then have another go. If you no. have a guess, that's it. If you're going to commit yourself, you've got to do it. You've got to no. be gung-ho about it. So we ha a lot of the time we have teams that probably could get it after one, but you need the guts to follow through with that. Yeah. So very, it's very, what I've noticed, though, is every time you're on another quiz, which you are quite a lot, mm. like another show, they'll always put an Only Connect round into their quiz, won't they? Yeah, because they know that Only Connect is the best quiz. <laughs> so they just, they just want to co-opt it. Just for those few minutes, they want to live the dream. <laughs> OK. Does anyone like Only Connect in here? Yeah. Right. What a strange thing that the, my nerdy audience would cross over with. <laughs> You need, to, you need to start putting in teams. We're going to be auditioning for a new series soon. We need new teams, new teams. So anyone that's any good at it, start getting your team together. Do you have to be able to remember what each of the things are, what they're called, or the funny python and stuff? <laughs> funny python. Yeah, they are up there on the board. You have to, the three lines. 
Yeah, OK, we're definitely not going to invite you next year, but <laughs> maybe so at a future... Can't be bothered with all that. Just Time. give us a question, Bamba. That's what I'll be saying. <laughs> next question. Don't know that one. Next question. That, I don't know what it's connected to. Have you ever seen a ghost? Not to my knowledge. <laughs> what, you're saying there are ghosts walking around that you might just have thought were regular people? Well, how do we know what ghosts go, look like? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> if you mean a sort of a kind of dangling bed sheet, <laughs> yeah. no. Okay. But ghosts may take the form of people. We think they're people. They could take the form of objects. Andy McH was here at the beginning of the... And now he's... This, he's sloped off. It's a, he was... A, shut up, he was winning it. <laughs> ruining it. People would have believed it. Um, have you ever seen a Bigfoot? Like the Sasquatch kind of Bigfoot? No. I think I had a dream the other day that someone answered that and they had done, and I was really excited. <laughs> and then I realised it was just a dream. <laughs> Um, where do you get your crazy ideas from? <laughs> I, once, uh, I once saw um, Barry Cryer, who I do think is absolutely wonderful, he but he was, he was doing a show in Edinburgh, and he told the joke, and then he sort of went, where did that come from? My head. <laughs> Which I was an amazing thing to say in the middle of a show. That's the correct answer. Oh, I tell you, I've got a new concept for a radio show. Okay. It's called Desert Island Dicks. It's not what you think it's going to be. I bet it is. It isn't. <laughs> Which eight Richards would you take to be with you on a desert island? You Which eight Richards? Yeah, your fa it has to be your favourite Richards or Richards you've got a story <laughs> about that remind you of something from your life. Do I mean? Do I? I I'm, I'm the luxury Richard. You always. I was going to say me. you're like you're like the Bible. Yeah, you're there. I'm always there. So I need eight other Richards. You need to. It's really. Can you name? Eight other Richards <laughs> without having prepared. It's really what it's become. You, uh, it's quite a difficult thing to do. If you're, if you're asking me whether I can name eight well known Richards, yeah. uh, yes, I can. And they also have to be the ones you would take to a desert island, though. Well, that's a different. <laughs> but I won't ask you why, but you just have to be honest that they would be the eight you'd take. Okay. Let's see which ones you'd go for. Well, I'd definitely take Richard Osman because, yeah. you know, he's a friend of mine and I think he's great and he knows lots of interesting things. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, Richard Bacon because he is always in a good mood. It's just amazing. He's sort of always cheery. Yeah. And it'd be quite nice to have around. But then when it got annoying that he was always cheery, then you might want Richard Iowade, who is... Yeah. He's sort of never that cheery, do you know what I mean? He's yeah. always quite downbeat, so that would be a nice balance. Yeah. These are good Richards you've chosen so far. Richard Maidley I'm quite <laughs> fond of. I think he's... No, I do. I think he's quite funny. Do, do they have to be alive? I no, mean, no, can no, I have, so like, he... Richard Lionheart? You can, yeah. Okay, I tell you, I tell you what, I tell you what, and I bet I get 100 points for this because you will never have heard a better one. Definitely, yeah. Richard O'Sullivan out of Dick Turpin. Yeah, that's good. Or Robin's Nest. I mean, Nest. fabulous. Yeah. And in fact, you could have Richard Carpenter who wrote the books of Dick Turpin on which that was based. And he also wrote Cat Weasel. There you go. <laughs> and that goes back to another one of these years ago where some, we did, had a discussion about Richard Carpenter because there's also Richard Carpenter from The Carpenters. You could I have don't him. want that one. No, OK. <laughs> Richard Carpenter, because I wasn't sure, and my audience usually know about these kind of things, so I'm glad that you've brought I wasn't sure he was the person I was thinking about. But he looked quite like Richard Stilgo as well, didn't he? Rich Carpenter, the yeah. writer. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He came and talked at my primary <laughs> school. I had, I had his autograph. Like, I wrote him a real fan letter. Yeah, it was good. Afterwards, and I had it in, a, I had it in an album. Exactly. His autograph. Have you still got it? I probably have somewhere. Yeah. Little little regard for Richard Carpenter's <laughs> autograph. Spike Milligan once gave someone the uh, someone said, "Can I have your autograph?" And Spike Milligan <laughs> said, "Why do you want to have my autograph? It's a weird thing." And he said, "Well, I want to, you know, I want to have it." And he said, "Would you treasure it and keep it?" And he said, uh, "Yeah, I definitely will." And he took his address, and then years later went round to his house <laughs> and said, "Where's my autograph?" And the guy didn't have it anymore. Really? Yeah. That's brilliant. So we've got, just to recap for people uh, who may have, we've got uh, Richard Osman, Richard yeah. Bacon, yeah. not Richard Baker, the newsreader, Richard Bacon, the uh, Channel 5, the ex-Radio 5 uh, Blue Peter presenter, mm. uh, Richard Ayoadi, mm. Richard O'Sullivan. Yeah, even Maidley was the fourth Richard one, yeah. Maidley, well done. It's kind of, this is kind of a good, this is the other element of the Desert Island Richards would be that someone else has to come in like Generation Game style 
and remember all eight, of <laughs> which the eight were. Uh, Richard O'Sullivan, if I said him. Yes, and then Richard Carpenter, they sort of go. Richard Carpenter, one more. No, she said, am I allowed to have Richard? Uh, no, don't start suggesting Richards. That's not, that's not the spirit of Desert Island Dicks. No, it's I... It's Victoria Corrin Mitchell's Desert Island Dicks, not yours. I mean, I think I would do Richard Lionheart if that's Little. allowed. Am I, but am I not allowed to have, like, my friend Richard? You are, yeah. Like, you don't know him. He, like, has a web company, but... As long as you know what his surname is, you can have him. So, I mean, yes, I do know what it is. What is it? Moross. Richard Moross. Yes, what? <laughs> What's wrong with that? Stupid. <laughs> so, so this is, so this is. Oh, that's you know. So this is how this works. You say the name of a friend of yours, an innocent man who chooses not to be in the public eye, yeah. and you attack. So I, the guest yeah. on Richard Herring's tabloid-style attack, yeah. I come along and you pillory my friend who's never done anything to you. Be I, te- I don't even want. <laughs> Let me tell you this: to make space in the boat, the luxury Richard is going overboard, <laughs> so the Richard Moros can really stretch out in the back. It's good because if I was on an island with Richard Moros, I'd be taking the piss out of him every day. <laughs> if it was Desert Island ants, you'd be on there, mate, and I'd be having a fucking, be having a fucking right go. There will never be a Desert Island ants. <laughs> they will never have that. Though a lot of people would like to see that program. It'd just be you on a desert island, your red glasses. I apologise for everything I've said uh, so far. So far. Uh, that's not just uh, today's podcast, that is all the podcasts. <laughs> I'd just like a blanket apology. Please don't... I, the thing is, I can't get sacked from this. If you're dapper laughs, ITV2 can go, Ooh, fuck yeah. off. But if you're me have doing they done this, that? they have sacked him oh, today. Have they? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Well, they haven't sacked him. They have. Uh, the, the people listening to this in 2015, he's probably on another channel. Uh, but uh, yeah, they've, uh, they're not renewing his uh, show. Okay. Due to sexism, his political correctness gone correct. <laughs> First, they came for dapper laughs. I said, I thought you were shit, so I didn't say anything. Then they said I was sexist. Um, do you have any unusual phobias? I don't know if it's unusual. Okay. I, I don't like flying. You don't like flying? No. Oh, God. Because... <laughs> no, I've just... I've just You've remembered, rem- haven't I, you? Yeah, I've remembered this. Yeah, uh... yeah I, I developed a very small fear of flying, just like a little... I started to not like it. I was uneasy, which I thought was going to be problematic because f- for poker, you know, you have to travel a lot. So I thought, well, I'll nip that in the bud. I can't start developing a fear of flying. So I went to see a fear of flying counsellor and he then died in a plane crash. Uh, so, yes, so I have pretty much, I think, lifelong fear of flying now. It didn't, it didn't, it, therapeutically, it didn't help. It's not like a wizard, though, is it? It's not like I can cure you, I can, I can cure plane crashes. It's just I can cure... No, but I mean, you know, part of, part of the thing was, let's get a sense of perspective unlikely. here. These plane crashes are very unlikely, they don't really happen, you've got an exaggerated, etc., 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 and that message was not reinforced <laughs> by him also being the person in my life that introduced me to the possibility that people you know can die in a plane crash. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I don't know, that's an unusual phobia, but it's an unusual reason for having it. It is, it's an awful thing. It's what's happening? He was a bad therapist. He's a dead man. No, he was a great therapist. Have, th- have some respect. <laughs> he, was, he was a great therapist, and God bless him, but that didn't particularly help me. That question <laughs> just remembered halfway through. Yeah, it's cheery. Good story, though. Yeah. I mean, for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm it's a terrible story. It was a good story for him as it was going, oh, this is, he probably turned to the person next to him and going, this is actually slightly ironic. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to enjoy, you're going to enjoy this irony. Also, I have a lot of superstitions. Right. I'm practically Chinese in that respect. I'm superstitious about everything, which isn't quite the same as a phobia. <laughs> Chinese people are very superstitious. Okay. They have a lot of... They buy into the concept of lucky and unlucky, okay. as do I. Okay. Even though I'm quite a rational person, I have a lot of superstitions. So it's not quite phobias, but I... You know, there's a lot of things I don't want to see. Okay. 
you know, pennies on the floor, okay. single magpies. I don't like to hear people talk about theoretical bad things that might happen. But you never see more than one magpie. You're always it's always one magpie. That's what it's, that's what is wrong with that. I do a routine about this, but it's the mag the magpie reward system is deeply flawed, <laughs> in that you always see one on it. So it's nearly always one, and one is for sorrow. How convenient. <laughs> so the magpies just have they never how many times you see gold you ne- hardly ever get gold from a magpie but you do sometimes Sorry, see a few of them ever. you sometimes do nearly always one on its own I mean it could be just you that nearly always it's sees cute. one <laughs> well it would explain a lot <laughs> you are very lucky as well you say oh you believe in luck what proof have you got oh 2.4 million dollars <laughs> uh, so you, are you superstitious when you're playing poker do you, do you yes I mean there's various there's hands that I like and don't like. But yeah. it, it, it's slightly nebulous with poker because, as with all of it, luck is a factor, but what you do with the luck determines whether you win or not. So, you know, it, it, to a casual observer, it might not be clear why I'll play a 7-4 of clubs very strongly, but I might throw a 7-5 away. That doesn't really make sense because I'm superstitious about that hand. However, having chosen to play that hand... <laughs> Now I know that piece of information. <laughs> yeah, but also it might be aces and you have to work out which. Yeah. It's seven four. <laughs> but you know, having having out. having chosen to play the hand, I'll then yeah. try and play it in a tricksy way or an aggressive way or you know, you, that, that's that's how poker differs from, you know, for example, chess. Yeah. You can make a really quirky move that might be wrong, but you can turn it to your advantage by playing it the right way. <laughs> yeah. It's like ghosts, though, isn't it, luck? L- like ghosts? It's like ghosts. In, in what sense? It does not exist. What, okay, whether ghosts exist or not <laughs> is a question for another time, but luck, definitely. I mean, what do you well, mean? it's just a random selection of stuff, you know, so some people will, uh, on average, be luckier in their lives than other people, but I don't think... I think positivity, maybe, can help people. Okay, what you're trying to say is that affecting luck is yeah. not possible. Not that luck doesn't exist. Well, yeah, yeah, people are, there are lucky people. Yes. Yeah, Patrick Marber for one. <laughs> uh, but, uh... <laughs> you're pretty, you are, you've had a pretty lucky life, apart from you know, the you phobia see, now, guy dying. You see, do you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to pinch my stomach. Yeah. Because you I think feel... You asleep. No, it's a superstition thing, because you've asserted that I have a lucky life. Yeah. Which... I, I'm not comfortable with that being oh, okay, said I because I feel like it's asking for trouble. Okay. There you go. That's one of my superstitions. So that's what I'm going to do that when I'm next playing you at poker. Yeah. Then you'd be too busy pinching your stomach yeah. to play your 7 4 properly. 7 <laughs> <laughs> 4 is not a good hand. <laughs> Just that's some little poker expertise for you there. Yes, but that's though, not that. You see, that's not how a poker player thinks. Yeah, you know, that's like telling Mozart, you know, C is not a good note. <laughs> it's about what you do with it. It is. It is. How do I win a million pounds at poker? <laughs> <laughs> well, Quickly, I'm... no, just tell me I, one thing. Don't, don't I don't want to know, I don't want to read all the books. Don't start with that aim. Okay. Don't start with that. I would never advise people how to do something like that. I will give people advice on how to not go skint at poker. Yeah. And once you've mastered that then you're aiming to make small and regular profits. When you've made enough profit that you can buy into a £5,000 tournament, you're not just pissing money out the wall, but you're doing it as a sensible investment, you might then find you win a million pounds. But uh, I would never advise anybody to start in poker with that aim because the ones that start off trying to do that are the ones who go skipped. That certainly happened to me. But (laughs) the way I look at it, I bought uh, one of those £10 uh, scratch cards the other day. You can win four million quid off those. How'd that go? So if I won that, that's better than all of your all your hard work. <laughs> Just by scratching off. All I had to do was scratch off some numbers. Mm. If four you, million pounds. It's it's now Monday. Yeah. If you went out and bought a lottery ticket now, yeah, and you chose six numbers for this Saturday's draw, statistically, you are more likely to die before the lottery's drawn than you are to win it. I am if you're involved, the the kiss of death. (laughs) Well, I mean, scratch away at your cards. This was a scratch card, though. I didn't even have to wait for the draw. No. My my wife thought I was an idiot for buying it. She thought it was a waste of £10. Mm, I said, even if, you know, it's £10, even if I don't win the jackpot, you've got to win at least 5000 for... It must be at least £5,000 for an investment of that much. 
I mean, most pint of scratch has a one pound or two pounds, so with ten pounds, you're definitely going to win. You're definitely going to win at least five thousand pounds. I wasn't being greedy. Yeah, I, d- I don't but know I, if gambling's for you. I, I got. <laughs> I didn't. Um, I didn't uh, win didn't anything. Win. I lost ten pounds. Mm, but is. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Because I had a lot of fun because I didn't scratch it straight away. I kept it in my pocket and we were walking back from Notting Hill to Shepherd's Bush. It took about half an hour. And all the time I was thinking, four million quid, isn't it? <laughs> it's the best half an hour of my life. <laughs> and, you know, it's like Schrodinger's cat, isn't it? That could be, it could be four million quid or it could not be four million quid until it was scratched. We it didn't sounds, know. It is, it is very so much Schrodinger's cat. So in the, the universe is infinite, then on one of the realities I'm in, I won four million pounds. So yes, the universe internet of your lifespan, however. Yeah. But Isn't I don't care as long as one of the Richard Herrings got lucky. In one of the universes, Rich, the, you, you went to Richard Herring, you're, what's it like being the unattractive one from Leon Herring? And you went, yeah, baby, you want to have a drink? Come on back to my place for some porridge. And I'm married to you in one of the universes, so, you know, that's what, I've got that going for me. <laughs> Are you confident yeah. that you have definitely grasp the principle of an infinite universe. I really am. And it, it definitely the way it works is that there's lots of Richard Herrings. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of everyone. Buying scratch cards. Well, I, I had a discussion with uh, Marcus Chown about this on uh, Richard Herring's Meaning of Life, which you can... Uh, down, I think you might even be able to download that one for free, uh, the whole conversation, but I don't agree because I think the scientific fact is that if the universe is infinite, everything possible has happened. And somewhere in the universe, everything is happening. I don't agree with that. Because I don't think impossible things can't happen. So therefore, so like I gave the example, I said, in none of the universes has now Amy Pond and 12 from House burst in through the back doors of here, run up here and ravished me and made love to me. That has not happened in any universe. Because <laughs> there were some, you know, some things within the logic of human civilization. Yeah, have, you, have, you, have you introduced a fictional character there, Richard? Well, I mean the actresses, but I was. Right. But I, I, I actually am only interested in the fictional... I don't like either of the actresses. I do <laughs> like the characters. I'm prepared to marry both of the characters okay. bigamously. Right. Especially if they're happy to be in that marriage. <laughs> and not even with me, just with each other. Uh, but uh, I'm not interested... The actresses are maniacs. I'm not interested in going out with... I'm I mean, also, I'm, 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 also I'm, I'm married to uh, my wife, but she does understand that if the character of Amy Pond and the character of Twelve from House want to have sex with me, then she's going, she will allow that. But not okay, the so, so your your allowed exceptions are fictional. Yeah, I'm allowed fictional. <laughs> I'm allowed if I can have sex with the fictional characters, and I would take that being if the actors were prepared to stay fully in character. <laughs> <laughs> I would say to them, this is the deal. I don't know if you're interested. <laughs> you will have to stay in character and react right. in the way you're character. I mean, I think a lot of actresses would see that as a I challenge. I think they think it was a, it was a <laughs> small price to pay. Yeah, for the, so yeah. it could happen. But some things wouldn't happen, so I think that proves that not everything would happen. Like a Neanderthal man's not going to just walk into this room in any of the realities. So that means some things aren't possible. Therefore, it means the universe isn't infinite, I think. I think I've proven yeah. that you know, to you see, uh, we, yeah, I mean, it's... It, w- where you're getting slightly confused... In one of your versions, you've got fictional characters. In another one, you've got time travel. Yeah. It, it, everything being possible in the universe doesn't mean that fiction and reality can combine and time travel becomes possible. It's. Yeah, it I mean, I'm no Stephen Hawking. No, you are not. Or you would know that. No, it's fine. There's a lot of Richard Herrings. They're all scratching cards. One of them has won four million. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I feel very happy for him. I'm no, I'm big. I'm a, I'm big enough to feel happy for that Richard Herring. Well done to him. If he's on telly as well, though, I'll be fucked off. Uh, so, um, <laughs> like on proper telly, like you are. Uh, so, um, uh, we, look, we've talked for really ages. It's been really good, and I would love to talk to you some Jesus, more. Yeah. Let's carry on talking. Uh, I could carry on asking you hypothetical uh, stupid questions uh, all the time. Do you have... I'll, I'll end on... <laughs> I'll end on this is stupid thing to do. Uh, do you have... Uh, a te- have you ever come up with a terrorist atrocity that you think would, uh, that would work? Because I've thought of loads. Um, yes, but it's such a good idea that it would be irresponsible well, of me to would say it. it. It'd be irresponsible of you not to say it. Because no, I'm not saying it. Because well, you're worried that terrorists are listening to this podcast. But the CIA and, you know, the, whatever the English one is... Uh, 
<laughs> of that might be listening as well. MI5 or whatever it is. It's Bodie and Doyle. Uh, it's, they'd be listening as well, and they'll go, oh, we'll look out for that. And what is it? Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't ever thought of a terrorist atrocity. Oh. And I definitely haven't committed one. <laughs> You're in the perfect position to do it, because you now mix with all... All the Terrorists? politician stuff. We well, you know you mixed with you have just today you're on I a TV show. I literally just went on a TV program that George Osborne was also on. That's not the same as I mixed with all the politicians. But you could have taken him out there. He could have been like a sleeper cell, Victoria <laughs> Corrin Mitchell. Even even David Mitchell doesn't know. It's like Homeland. He's not he's just, he's suspicious because of that time you spent a year in a prison in Afghanistan. Yeah. Then you came back again. If this the universe is infinite, that happened. Uh, to one of the Victoria <laughs> Corrin Mitchells. Uh, and uh, it gets to a point, doesn't it, where it suddenly gets a bit giddy and weird. Yeah, that is yeah, weird. We're at, this, we're at this point. Let's ask a nicer thing, not okay. about a terrorist atrocity, a nice thing about maybe a kitten. Okay. <laughs> if you were dying... <laughs> this is still nice. Which celebrity would you like to stroke your hair as you die? <laughs> I mean, what, 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 uh, Sue Pollard. It's good. It's good. It's good when people, I, you know, because if you answer that question straight away, you come up with interesting answers that say more about the person. I chose Bounce of the Dog from Neighbours. Could, you couldn't really stroke your hair. Exactly. Could he? That, that was still the first thing that popped into my it's mind. Interesting, yeah. Out of nowhere, without me thinking about it. And I Sue think Pollard it's is because similar. Sue Pollard, when you say the word celebrity. Yeah, you think of. <laughs> Super See, because you know, you, you look at me because so you think, oh, yeah, she'll say David Mitchell, which I wouldn't for two reasons. One, I don't think of him as a celebrity. Two, I feel guilty about the fact that I probably will die before him, and that's not fair because that's not meant to happen to men, and I warn him about that sometimes, and he gets sad. So, if, <laughs> if I could... Would you like me to kill David Mitchell? <laughs> I will happily do it. I'm but... a bit too happy. I'd be a bit... I really like him. I would still be a bit too happy about murdering him. <laughs> but, but the other thing is, when you say the word celebrity, I think Sue Pollard comes into my head because that is what I call a celebrity. Yeah. She gave it some, you know, the fabulous clothes, the zany glasses, the big personality. Not your kind of mumbling, sort of cool person in normal clothes. Like a big, exciting... When she came on the TV, you knew the TV was on. <laughs> <laughs> so I think of her when you say celebrity. She's stroking your hair. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've, I very much enjoyed I it. I bet you do it nicely as well. She I bet would. she's a kind person. I'm becoming slightly upset. I'm going to have to try and contact her in some way. Would you like me to... If I find out, if I hear you're dying... Yeah. ..as a kind of Make-A-Wish foundation... <laughs> ..with my four million pounds I've made on the lottery... Yeah. ..I could give a million of it to Sue Pollard. <laughs> Say, will you go and straight Victoria's hair? Yeah. As she dies. <laughs> you have to... You have to stay there. If she get, gets better again, you keep, have to keep on stroking. <laughs> Do you think she might, she might cure you? Well, I, I think if Sue let's if you assume were, yes, because otherwise it's kind of a downbeat yeah. ending for this show, isn't it? So Sue Pollard has just saved your life. Yeah. And, it's all and then, again. just to make everything perfect, she murders David Mitchell <laughs> so that he doesn't die <laughs> after you. <laughs> it's, it's, quite, it's like the end that's, of... That's, that's quite the fairy tale the ending. End, like, it's like... <laughs> It's like the end of Death on the Nile, where... Um, Don't the, spoil it, people might not have seen it. No, they should have watched it. The, the, uh, <laughs> it's the, there's a couple of them have done it, and they're pretending they don't like each other anymore, but they do, and then she shoots him because he's too simple to go to prison. Basically, that, and he's too pretty to go to prison. Is that it? Simon McCorkendale? Is that who it is? Yeah, yeah. That's not a name, is it? Simon McCorkendale? <laughs> That was the, the only time David ever tried to have a bet against me. <laughs> right. He tried to bet me that it was Michael York. Right. And as I pocketed his £20, <laughs> I gave him the key life advice I will leave you with, never bet on facts. Because <laughs> <laughs> you'd already seen the film. If a person's going to take your bet on a fact, they know better than you. Okay. Bet on potential outcomes, not facts. I bet you David Mitchell won that bet. I bet you £20. <laughs> All right, I'll accept that bet. <laughs> OK. And we, we can settle right, up I'll in the dressing room. I'll give you a copy of Talking Cock uh, <laughs> instead, in lieu of it, if I've lost. Ladies and gentlemen, Victoria Corrin Mitchell. Fantastic. Good. 
We're back next week with uh, Sue Perkins and one other. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs> that is another podcast all wrapped up and inside a can. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, do go and see me on tour. If you can, check out richardherring.com slash gigs. Uh, and you can find out if I'm coming to a town near to you. Uh, go to gofasterstripe.com slash badges. Buy a monthly badge. You get all kinds of extras, including some backstage stuff that you can't see anywhere else. If the guys have remembered to press play and record on the camera this time. You never know. Uh, see you next time. Still some more to come. It's going on forever this year, isn't it? See you later. Bye. <laughs>